Hello and welcome to episode 50 of Radicals in Conversation, the monthly podcast from Pluto Press, one of the world's leading independent radical publishers. I'm your host, Chris Brown. Almost two years into the COVID-19 pandemic, and the limits of a neoliberal public health orthodoxy have been well and truly exposed. But instead of imagining and pushing for radical change, the left finds itself stuck in a rearguard action focused on defending the NHS from the ever-threatening wrecking ball of privatisation. This month, Pluto publishes a fantastic new book called The Five Health Frontiers, A New Radical Blueprint. Public health expert Chris Thomas argues that we must emerge from the pandemic on the offensive with a bold new vision for our health and social care. Chris maps out five new frontiers for public health and imagines how we can move beyond safeguarding what we have towards a revitalisation and radical expansion of the principles put forward by Anarin Bevan, the founder of the NHS, over 70 years ago. Beyond recalibrating our approach to healthcare, this radical blueprint calls for a fundamental redesign of our economy through public health net zero, a bold new universal public health service that's fit to address the real causes of ill health and a major recalibration in the efforts against the epidemiological reality of an era of pandemics. So it's my great pleasure to be joined on the panel today by Chris Thomas, author of The Five Health Frontiers, and also Sonia Adasara, an NHS doctor and health campaigner. We'll be discussing all of this and much more. As always, podcast listeners can get 50% off the new book on plutobooks.com. All you have to do is use the coupon podcast at the checkout. Okay, without further ado, this is Chris Thomas and Dr. Sonia Adesara on Radicals in Conversation. Happy New Year to everybody listening. This is our 50th episode, actually, of the podcast, which is a nice little milestone uh, for us here at Pluto. I thought, given that we're recording this sort of midway through January 2022, two years basically into the pandemic now, now many of our listeners aren't based in Britain, so they might not be familiar with all the sort of ins and outs of our health system. But I'm sure many of them will be aware that our government's response to the pandemic has been sort of far from exemplary. You never know, like there's a chance that given recent revelations, Boris Johnson may have been booted out of number 10 um, by the time this episode airs. We live in hope. Um But the path the government seemed to have chosen is to sort of let the Omicron variant kind of run wild, really. And I think we peaked at around 170,000 new infections per day last week as a sort of starting point. It might be helpful to put some things in context. What's the situation in the National Health Service right now? Some of the main challenges uh, that the NHS is currently grappling with, as I say, sort of two years into the pandemic. Yeah, I think, well, the first thing to say is that we went into this pandemic in not in a good position in our NHS. So I remember I was working in a e department and this would have been, I think, December, January 2020. And it's when we, I remember just looking at my phone and seeing something on social media about COVID. And I think I, think I joked with one of my colleagues standing next to me, like, oh, God, if this hits us, we are... F you, you know, probably swore, but, I just, but it was, I remember that winter and I remember that a e department, you know, I was doing night shifts and we would have people waiting, you know, six, eight hours sometimes to see a doctor. We were constantly running out of hospital beds. The whole health service was under massive strain. And that has been the position, you know, in the past few years, and it's been getting worse and worse year on year in the health service. And then I feel for the past two years, we've been basically firefighting and that's in hospitals, but also in primary care as well. And yes, we've had sort of peaks um, and waves of when the virus has been at its worst and it's been maximum strain, you know, particularly on hospital beds in in hospitals. But it has been extremely busy throughout the past two years and there hasn't really been any let up. Now we are, you know, in January doing this podcast and yeah, you said cases of Omicron have been very high over the past couple of weeks. We have seen large numbers of people being admitted to hospital with Omicron. Um, The proportion of people being admitted is less than what we've seen with previous variants. And I think that's a combination of maybe this variant being less severe, but also high levels of immunity amongst the population. But we're still seeing high numbers of people being admitted. And the problem is, is that our hospitals over the past few years have been running in a um, with very limited spare capacity. So we're constantly running with often close to full capacity. So it doesn't take much for our hospitals to get into a position where they run out of hospital beds. And that's what has happened quite frequently. It happened in my local hospital just before Christmas, actually, that they had to put in a critical alert because they'd run out of hospital beds. So that's the acute situation. But then there's an underlying growing problem, which we probably don't talk about enough in that I now work in general practice in primary care, and we're seeing a growing number of people with health conditions 
who are seeing their health conditions getting worse, seeing their disabilities getting worse, living with pain, and they're not able to get the health treatment that they need, whether that's because they can't get access to GPs, but also because maybe they're getting, they're seeing their GPs, the GPs are referring them to get the hospital care or because they need specialist treatment or because they need surgeries. And there's been delays on that. And we know that there's, you know, I've got many, many patients now who've been waiting sometimes six months, sometimes a year, sometimes two, three years to get the treatment that they need. And we're seeing their conditions deteriorate and they're becoming more debilitated and, you know, spending much of their lives now living in pain and disability because of that. So we have that growing problem, which is set to get worse, I think, over the next year. So there's these two problems there that are growing. And then alongside that, we have, as many of your listeners, particularly UK listeners will know, we've got problems with not enough staffing in the health service and in the care sector. And then we have this massive problem in our social care sector where we just don't have enough capacity. There is real variability in care available, unequal access in care. So we have many elderly people or people with disabilities who are not being cared for properly and not getting the care that they need. Mm, Yeah, thanks, Sonia. I mean, it doesn't sort of paint a great picture. and, And a lot of what you've touched on there will definitely come back to in the course of the conversation. What you're saying there. Does that account for the fact that the UK experienced a much sort of higher proportion or ratio, I guess, of like COVID deaths across the world than it should have done, given that, you know, I think the statistic, there's a statistic in Chris's book that was in February of last year, so February 2021, the UK experienced one in every 25 COVID deaths globally, despite being home to just one in every hundred people on the planet. And and I suppose it's worth pointing out that that could have been even worse because so much of the healthcare system was put on pause, shut down or sort of diverted towards um, the crisis. Why has the country seen such a disproportionately high rate of deaths? Is it down to the factors that you've just kind of outlined there or is there anything else at play? Issues with capacity in a healthcare service is, is just one reason. But I think probably a larger reason is the fact that we have um, large numbers of people in this country who are living with ill health. So they have health conditions that make them more vulnerable to becoming very unwell and to dying from COVID. There's that phrase of UK being the sick man of Europe. And what they mean by that is that we have large numbers of people, particularly people who live in the poorest areas of the country, people who are, you know, working class, people who um, are living in poverty, who are more vulnerable to ill health and are having health conditions, whether that's lung disease or heart disease or high blood pressure or diabetes. And they're having these conditions at a younger age than, let's say, wealthier people in this country. Um, And then that's made them more vulnerable to becoming unwell with COVID and more likely to be needing hospital treatment and, and, and more vulnerable to dying from COVID. So I think, you know, that's probably something that we didn't really focus on enough, but we've known about this for for many years. And Chris really articulates this really well in his book that we have such really, you know, an astonishing and unacceptable level of health inequality in this country. And we haven't really done enough and we haven't got a system in place to address that. Mm, Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, just talking about disparities there, there was something again in Chris's book, and I'll bring you in in a second, Chris, but I thought it was really fascinating was how, You know, we all know by now that COVID was not this great equaliser, that the impact was disproportionately felt by, you know, working class people, people of colour and so on. Um, But it's fascinating in the book, you say that even long COVID is more prevalent amongst people in the most deprived parts of the country. Um, Does anyone want to say a little bit more about some of the severe health disparities that have been, I guess, revealed by the pandemic more than, you know, uh, a consequence of it? Yeah, I think you're absolutely right, Chris, that it's that word revealed, isn't it, that's that's really important in that we are seeing something in the pandemic that is long-standing structural weaknesses in how, how the UK has approached health over the last 40 years, but now exposed at a scale that we can no longer ignore. And one of the big weaknesses that we had was that level of disparity whereby people, you know, depending on their income, depending on their occupation, their ethnicity, whatever it might be, do experience worse outcomes. In the book, I think I talk about the way that, you know, despite the fact that we have an NHS that in some cases leads some to believe that we've kind of solved these issues, we still have a public health system that distributes the best health to the the richest and the most powerful and leaves, as Sonny put so well, lots of people uh, to, to lead long periods of their life in poor health or to die much earlier. I think the, the stats in there are 10 years difference in life expectancy, but, you know, kind of two decades difference in reasonable quality of life. So some really stark differences. 
the thing I think it reveals to me is that uh, I always think back to A Christmas Carol in this instance, and and there's a big question that's plagued academic literature, which is why Tiny Tim was sick, because it's probably not down to, if you look at the kind of clues that Dickens leaves in that book or that novella, it's probably not down to kind of any lack of access to the NHS or to, to medicine. It's down to the social circumstances he finds himself in. It's down to the lack of food. It's down to the cold, smoky room. It's down to the kind of slum housing that he lives in. It's down to the bad boss that his dad has and the kind of income question, the money question that comes in there. So, you know, if we translate that forward, what we see is that we haven't got away from that kind of Tiny Tim style of situation. Um, People still very much find that their housing, their education, their employment undermines their health. And these are all things in the lead up to the COVID-19 pandemic that the government cut in many cases, uh, you know, kind of quite severely during austerity. And these undermined the resilience that we have going in. So, you know, we can think about inequality as, as one of those big structural deficits. We can also think about inequality as a structural deficit that was worsened in the 10 years going into COVID, and which the government haven't really looked at in terms of thinking through solutions or in terms of mitigating the pandemic as it's hit. I think that's a, a key thing that we've had revealed, and it's a key thing that we need to change if we're thinking about what comes next, what are the big activist demands that we need for the next period after, after the pandemic or as the pandemic moves to an endemic. Mm, yeah, uh, well, there's there's lots that you're starting to touch on that we will come back to. I mean, we've alluded, I guess, already to this new book that you've written, Chris, The Five Health Frontiers, A New Radical Blueprint. So firstly, congratulations on the book. It's a, it's really fantastic. It's full of great ideas and, and lots of sort of empirical, uh, you know, evidence to sort of back up the claims and so on. The frontiers here in the title, these refer to different areas in which you believe there's sort of the greatest scope for improving our approach to health and and social care. Could you say, just sort of in brief, I guess, what these five different areas or five different frontiers are? Yeah, absolutely. So going in, the the core argument, I suppose, is that we've seen massive progress in the health agenda through the NHS, but that achievement, that massive achievement is now 75 years old. And we've seen a pandemic that shows that actually the, the public health status quo isn't maybe quite as good as we might think when we say oh, the NHS is a crowning achievement of democratic socialism. So the five frontiers are about where can we as activists look to push forward and deliver a new settlement that's that's more uh, focused on the 21st century and the health needs that people experience today. So obviously that means healthcare, that means a revitalization of the NHS and that's the first frontier is how do we revitalize the NHS in light of COVID and given some of the changes in health that we've seen. But it's also about people's health needs that go beyond healthcare. So as I say, people experience health needs that are down to education or income or uh, housing. We know those things are really important to a, to a healthy life. So it's also about making sure that on the one hand, we can meet those needs, that we can, for example, you know, give someone in the same way that we would a cancer treatment, a social intervention, but also stop taking that Scrooge comparison, bad bosses, bad landlords from undermining people's health. It's about social care and making sure that we extend the kind of ideas from the NHS into social care. And it's about preparing for the future. There's a really alarming reality that COVID-19 isn't once in a lifetime. Pandemics are now quite likely to the point that most of us can expect one or two more in our lifetime. So it's about thinking about what global health looks like and making sure that we're much better prepared next time a health shock emerges. Mm, yeah, I mean, just on that last point about living in the era of pandemics, it was it was very depressing reading, I have to say, but um, we'll, we'll come on to that uh, in due course. <laughs> so, I mean, at the moment, like you, you talk early on in the book about the kind of dynamic that activism around healthcare has been has been in the, the approach to healthcare. We're stuck in a kind of rearguard action, permanently on the defensive, talking about the NHS. Could you sort of say a little bit more about this, what some of the problems are in the way that, you know, the left traditionally has dealt with questions about healthcare and dealt with attacks on healthcare? Yeah, absolutely. So the book kind of talks about this in terms of, of the defensive approach of activism on healthcare. And we might say contrast that to the more offensive or expansive campaigns that exist on climate change or the new economy, which are about 
saying that the status quo doesn't work and trying to find ways to improve that or new settlements or new ways of, of being. Um, but on the NHS and on healthcare, we don't tend to do that on the left. I think we tend to instead suggest that actually, you know, in many cases, health is an agenda that we've won on. We we say, you know, we we have a universal free at the point of need service. So we we put the NHS in the the win column. We kind of tick it up. In some cases, that means that the NHS is used almost as this kind of image of how democratic socialism works and how it can work and how it can be a better alternative to the to the status quo that exists on other agendas. So we're very enamoured by it. And I think in many cases, rightly, um, but the colours the kind of activism that emerges in two ways. So one is that it often means that we're quite nervous about any criticism or anything that could be interpreted as kind of a narrative around the NHS not working. The the left tends to go in for more romanticised versions of the NHS that really focus on its strong points. And the other thing is that we tend to focus on this rearguard action, as, as you say, Chris, which is essentially that we, we're nervous about the NHS being sold off or uh, being privatised in one sudden moment, some kind of shock and awe strategy. That could be an American trade deal. That could be the current health and social care bill that's going through Parliament. That's, that's the kind of way that we see the NHS failing. But in fact, if we look at health and care, we see two things that I think are really interesting. One is that the biggest driver of privatisation isn't one-off set pieces. It isn't kind of some Thatcher-style denationalisation. It's that the performance and the quality and the experience of people going into the NHS, and particularly during COVID, isn't as good as it could be. It isn't as good as is possible. It isn't the fastest access, the best quality, the best experience, the most coordinated and continuous care. And that means what we're seeing is people opting out or as I put it buying out of the health service so they're saying you know what I'll take 100 pounds for a GP fast track I'll buy private insurance um, or it might be that more employers are offering private insurance and you can see that in the data that more people are either paying directly for their own health care or taking private insurance as a supplement to their entitlement and that's really worrying because the NHS has always thrived on this kind of consensus that exists around it, the the kind of electoral support that it has is that it benefits everyone. It provides everyone, almost everyone, better care than they would otherwise get. And as that starts to erode, then I think what we might see is the electoral coalition behind the NHS erode. And there's a case study of this for us to kind of think about, which is dentistry. We've, we've already seen this happen in dentistry, which is that fees are now very common, poor access and experience for those that are going purely through the NHS are very common, and that's kind of been normalised in some way. So the challenge that lays down for the left and for activists is, I suppose, to think about whether the status quo that we have is really working, whether as it stands, we've genuinely won on the public health care agenda. And if we realise that we haven't, to start thinking about ways that we can go back to the core principles that Bevan set out in the 1940s and revitalise them for the 21st century, how we can think about universality being the key here, that everyone has access to the, the quickest, the best, the fastest, the most effective health care possible. Because if we don't start thinking about that kind of quality question, if we're too preoccupied by the kind of idea that it might just suddenly be privatised, then actually it will be privatised, just we won't notice because it will happen gradually, it will happen slowly. Um, And it will happen because people are buying out and supplementing their care with private alternatives. I'm sure, Sonia, you've you've probably seen uh, the kind of things that I'm talking about in terms of the sheer strain the NHS is under and how difficult that makes it to run at the top of its game rather than just at the very top of its capacity yeah definitely and you know I I became a health campaigner um a few years ago because actually I saw bad care in the health service and I think we know I guess maybe as health campaigners we are too defensive about this but I've seen many examples of bad care over the years I think it's increasing and you know actually just you know I've got a member of my family who is very sick has many health conditions and I've seen over the past few months 
how this much of a struggle it has been for him to get decent care, whether that's being able to get, you know, speak to the GP, speak to specialists. And he's had really poor care over the past few months. It definitely is getting worse over the past two years with COVID. But I have so many patients who I'm, you know, I just feel like so sad, actually, when you're speaking to them and you see them and you see how ill and unwell they are and they are not getting that the care that they deserve and that they need. Um, and and definitely this problem about we're focusing too much on sort of that privatisation, but forgetting actually the reason why people are going towards the private sector is because they're getting bad care. We, do, we need to understand that and address that. It's not a wealthy area that I work in, but I have quite a few patients who are asking me to write letters so they can be referred and go private because actually often they've been waiting sometimes, you know, months, years just to try and to see someone. And so they're getting stuck. But also increasingly now, um, you know, even friends of mine who are paying to see GPs privately so they can pay, let's say, 30 quid or 50 quid to see a GP. They actually able to see a GP. They can see it at their own convenience. Um, and so it's, it's going to increase. And I think if we don't speak about this and if we don't address the fact that care isn't good enough for many cases in the NHS and people will go private, then it's going to be an increasing problem. You know, we talk about in this country, the NHS being the closest thing that we have to a religion as, you know, as if, you know, people, yes, people do love the NHS and are very grateful for it. But that doesn't mean people will continue to support it in its current state if, if they feel that the care that they or their loved ones are getting is not good. And I think I think that gives us a, an opportunity in a way. And the opportunity is to learn from what the right are doing. So I'm sure people may have seen, but if they haven't, that there's there's a real trend, particularly within the right media, to harness on to instances where they say healthcare, public universal healthcare in the UK isn't working, it isn't providing care that's as good as is possible that is found in other countries. And what they essentially argue is that comes down to the progressive founding principles of the NHS. The right-wing argument is that people aren't getting the right access, the right quality, the right speed of experience of care. And that's because of the things that Bevan did in 1948. And what they're essentially doing is they're, they're making it about political economy. But what the reality that we might put forward, the kind of direct contention to that line of argument from the right, is that actually the NHS never fails at the moment because it's too progressive. It only ever fails where the progressive foundations that it have have been skewed by neoliberal reforms. Um, we can't ignore that the kind of purity of the of the principles behind the NHS has come up against 40 years of competition and market orientated reforms instigated by the Thatcher government's continued um, under the guise of new public management by the Blair governments and then reorientated to um, constraining the capacity of the NHS during austerity. And if we were to think about it in those terms, I think what we'd actually say is that, you know, the NHS as a kind of conceptual theoretical thing is brilliant. We can absolutely support the kind of principles of universality of free at the point of need of the things that make it so great but that in practice those things aren't working in a way that we're happy with and that that is causing people to lose faith in the very operating model that we think is right and that starts to identify really clear campaign goals around whether competition orientated reforms in the NHS are right but also just around making sure that within left campaigns that things like good access to care a brilliant experience and um, the best possible types of treatment being available to everyone those kind of things that the NHS was always meant to be about that those are central to our thinking as well um, and that it's not always just down to privatization without an end point um, I think everyone on this on this podcast agrees that that the NHS should be proudly and completely public that that we need to do more maybe in our activism to talk about the reasons why we think that and to link it to the experiences that people have when they're at their most vulnerable. It's it's interesting hearing about, yeah, how neoliberalism has kind of corrupted it in a sense. And you've got now this um where efficiency is seen as like the the driving logic behind the health service. And I think in the book, Chris, you talk about how we need to replace that sort of logic and embed sort of resilience maybe or, or some other kind of concept as the driving force by which decisions are made. I think that's spot on. The, the big transition that I think is, is quite toxic really to, to how the health 
service is run and the experience of people working in it and people using it to, you know, kind of draw on healthcare is that efficiency has become the goal. And I think you kind of see the seeds of this sown in the in the 1980s, really, which is a period when there's a real fear around the aging of the population. This kind of narrative emerges around healthcare, which is essentially that we might see costs that just rise and rise and rise almost indefinitely um, because people are getting older and they need more care and more people in the population are living with you know, chronic long-term health conditions like arthritis or, or, or diabetes, or it could be just that the survival rate of cancer is now six times as long as it was in the 1940s. So, so there was that real fear kind of being trumpeted, particularly by the right. And their kind of genius was to almost make sustainability in healthcare synonymous with efficiency. So we can only continue to have healthcare if we can keep the cost as low as possible. And after a certain threshold, we won't be able to, you know, do it. And that was that was kind of the line of argument that emerged. And it was, you know, it, it was carried forward in the decades since, and it's still something that that's very common today. The problem is, is that we can kind of see the costs of that short sightedness through COVID, can't we? Because we essentially have a process whereby lots of the capacity was stripped out of the NHS, but it became very orientated around not necessarily delivering the best healthcare, but definitely getting the best price for, for any healthcare it did deliver. That, you know, people were asked to work um, in much worse staffed wards, that beds were closed, that hospital occupancy rates went through the roof, that we wouldn't invest in new technology, that buildings started falling apart. This, this all kind of happened over the last decade. And then COVID-19 hits and we don't have the capacity to deal with it in many ways. Uh, We don't have the capacity to manage it. And as new variants emerge, we still don't have the capacity to manage it. And on the basis of the lack of NHS capacity, the government takes decisions like, as they did in December, you know, restricting certain sectors of the economy, of uh, cancelling routine care for several weeks, of leaving the NHS to run into critical incidents. So that has a big health cost, but also has a big economy cost. That's something that COVID-19 has really demonstrated. So I think we do need to reorientate around resilience rather than efficiency, because one of the really scary things we face going into the future is that health shocks are now a reality. And that could be future pandemics. There was an academic paper released that suggested the annual risk of a COVID-19 scale pandemic was now 2% per year, uh, which is very scary because that for you know someone born today might be on average, two pandemics of this size in a lifetime, and 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 they have a scarring effect. COVID nineteen will be endemic, so uh, each of these is massive disruption, but but it has a, a legacy effect as well that goes on for a lot longer. But it might not even be that. It might be that antibiotics are not working anymore. It might be that the population just just getting much older. It might be the kind of consequences of climate change that constitute the health shocks. And I think. If we don't think more about how we can protect the universality of healthcare in the context of how vulnerable we are to these big shocks, then we'll find ourselves in big difficulty. We'll find, Sonia, as you said, that people lose faith in the NHS as a model because it can't provide them the security that they need. But we'll also find that we don't have a healthcare model or the capacity within our healthcare system to protect our health, our economy as well from these major, major shocks um, that could cause huge, huge destruction on a, on a relatively regular basis for the next century. I mean, I want to get into some of the, the sort of the more concrete proposals that you put forward. But just before we do, I suppose, talking about this sustainability sort of frontier side of things, you know, thinking to the future, it seems like there's a risk that we learn entirely the wrong lessons from COVID. And you talk about how there's been an emerging framework or rubric again coming from the government uh, around uh, health security in which you know they're thinking about the response to other covid like or covid scale crises in the future what's implied in this sort of health security paradigm and why is it maybe not the best approach for yeah thinking about healthcare in the future yeah you're right it, it is emerging isn't it i mean there was a moment that it really became apparent to me which was that there was kind of a pre-briefed new body to be announced that, that at the very last minute had its name changed to the uk health security agency and what became very clear particularly you know several points over the last 12 months was that that the government was going to focus on security that was going to be one of its big tenants um 
And I suppose the problem with security, there are a few reasons that the paradigm kind of gets a lot of raised eyebrows and treated rightfully with with suspicion. But one is that it's a very nativist concept. It's very much about making sure that a country is insulated from the worst impacts of the growing health vulnerability that I've talked about, rather than making sure that we prevent them at source or that we do the things that would genuinely create a sustainable global health system. And I suppose what that means is that if you go down a security route, might get to a point or or would almost definitely get to a point where what you're doing is thinking about how can we avoid being impacted by something that will happen, but we're not necessarily thinking about how we can prevent things from happening at source. And we're not considering pandemics and the risk of, of global health shocks in terms of their structural and systematic kind of bases insofar as we know conceptually what the kind of causes are. The causes of growing pandemic risk are almost entirely the same as the risk factors for climate emergency and nature emergency. They're the close proximity of people and animals, habitat destruction, the increase in global trade and travel, the kind of connectivity people have across the world that's often used in in the favour of a small number of people in a small number of rich countries. So we know what the dynamics are and security lets the government, the UK government, just almost entirely ignore that and say what what we care about isn't prevention, it's insulation. So there is a real worry there that we learn the wrong lesson and uh, that we're satisfied with a response after COVID that's about hoping that, that we can pull through even if others in the world can't. Of course, the implicit risk there is that we don't know what the dynamics of future viruses, infectious diseases might be. It's epitomised by we've done in the UK between 2010 and 2020, lots to prepare for an influenza pandemic. That preparedness was actually pretty good. Um, But a coronavirus, we couldn't just translate that knowledge across. And so we were caught out quite spectacularly. Mm. Yeah, thanks, Chris. Well, maybe it'd be interesting to move the discussion on a little bit. We've talked about the NHS as it is. And I suppose, yeah, part of the argument of your book is that we need to move the discussion on from just discussing the NHS uh, into areas that we might not traditionally think of as, you know, under the umbrella of public health. Now, both you and Sonia have touched on some of these already. Uh, You know, we've mentioned housing and stuff like that. Are there any other things that you would sort of allude to under the sort of idea of bringing in a social justice framework here that are equally important and have this big impact on health that we should be taking into account? in talking about, you know, building a different or a better uh, approach to healthcare. I'd be interested, Sonia, in what you'd say the kind of biggest factors are that that feel like they underpin people coming, uh, you know, that could be in Tottenham coming in and facing either, uh, that's either a cause of ill health or might make it so much more difficult for them. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting. I was so I I work um I work in general practice in Tottenham. I work in two different clinics. So for those who don't know, Tottenham's in North London, it's a, you know, in a city. Even though the clinic's about I guess maybe five minute car journey between the two, um, the demographic of people are quite different. So you've got the what first clinic who I work in most of the week where. I guess it's old Tottenham, um, quite a lot of poverty, high ethnic minority population, very working class. Um, And then the second clinic is near the canal where there's lots of new build flats. So the demographic of population there is more, I guess, more middle class, more wealthy population. And it's so interesting when I first started working, I, I couldn't believe it, how different my day was depending on where I was working like it's it's literally like a completely different clinic so when I'm working you know in the one near the canal it's it's quite easy you know most of my patients I can deal with quite easily you know I can just prescribe them what they need get whatever scan that they need and it's quite a satisfying job to be honest and then when I'm working in the other clinic where I was working today it is difficult and I find it very difficult because a lot of the patients coming in they have really complex health needs with no easy fix, I often feel like I'm not doing enough really to address their their underlying problems and their health issues. And it is like as those things that like Chris mentioned, you know, it's a combination of their housing conditions, um, their jobs, poverty, um, but also I think you know I don't know if it's quite they just seem to have a lack of autonomy in their lives and a lack of power over their lives, which is impacting their ability to live healthy lives. I realize that's quite an abstract thing to say and it's quite complex but I, I for me there's something there that there's just they just don't have that autonomy in the way that sort of my middle class population do 
and and they just don't have that control over their lives. So yes, it's about wealth and it's about class and it's about um, education, but also it's about having that autonomy to have a healthy life. And it's something that I've not quite worked out and and I'm struggling to articulate how it plays out, but it's something that I've noticed that's a difference. And it's really stark, like, and it's sort of, it's in the same area and yet literally different health conditions. um, And it's a completely different clinic. To be honest, I often feel like I am sort of giving people pills and prescribing things. And it just feels like it's giving people a plaster when they've got sort of a gaping, bleeding wound. Like it's not going to work what I'm doing and, and you're just patching things over, but you're not actually addressing the underlying issues that are causing them to live with sickness. Um, and whether that's physical or mental sickness, when you're living with sickness, you're just not able to live a joyous and a, a dignified life in the way that you can do if you have good health. I think what's really interesting there is that kind of powerlessness as well that you're talking about, Sonia, in terms of your own kind of thinking that the means that you've got at your disposal don't feel like they're proportionate to the kind of things people are coming in and that really they need from a health perspective, from a purely health perspective. And I suppose one thing that I think is interesting that I trace through that's happened over the last 70 years is that health and healthcare uh, or public health and healthcare have been kind of synonymized. Health is the NHS, it's hospitals, and that kind of perception has has grown. And I think that ties back to what we were talking about in terms of the kind of place that the NHS sits within the kind of left narrative and left activism as kind of this brilliant thing that we need to defend from privatisation often makes us think very exclusively about healthcare when there's a lot of other things that are, that are very important to health and to health justice, as I describe it. So... That wasn't always the case. Um, When the first ever Ministry of Health was formed, it very much didn't just have remit for healthcare. It also had pollution in the department. It had housing, it had lots of the poor laws. Um, This was 1919. Uh, It had lots of local authority stuff. It really was a much more diverse department, but that kind of breadth of the definition of health has, has been narrowed. And I don't think anyone would bemoan the NHS. I mean, I think I think it's the most humanising policy invention, service invention that we've had in modern history. But that is one consequence. So the book lays down a bit of a challenge, uh, I suppose, which is to start thinking about how we can use a broader definition of health in our activism and one that's anchored in justice and one that's compatible with structural systematic level thinking that's going on in, in the climate movement, new economy movement, some, some brilliant examples. And, you know, one solution that comes up there, and um, Sonia ties very clearly to your point around, do people have the kind of prescription, shall we say, that are needed to, you know, kind of give people healthy lives when um, actually medical interventions aren't the main thing that's needed? It's not necessarily treatment. One of the ideas is universal public health service. And the universal public health service would be all about saying that we recognise that empirically, There are things that aren't medical interventions that are important to health. I I did a bit of research into what the kind of key things would be and the things that come up are income, housing, forms of poverty that include utility poverty, fuel poverty, food poverty, uh, education, um, the things that give a real founding of a a healthy life and that really explain why some people, normally rich and and powerful people, have very healthy long lives and, and others really struggle with their health throughout their life. What we could do is is essentially say on the same justification that we're happy to provide free at the point of delivery based on need, a course of cancer treatment for someone that needs it. Why, why wouldn't we be happy to provide free, high quality, healthy housing to someone who we can tell with certainty, at least at the population level, that that will help them avoid illness, that that will provide them a healthy life. So I think that is an incredibly key frontier for us to think about is how can we complete the work that Bevan started in the medical side of health, in that kind of healthcare side of health? How can we expand that? How can we complete the work and take that into social interventions like houses, like great education to really embody that? You know, it's, it's at the point of need. It's embodying that definition, and expanding it further. Mm. Yeah, it'd be, it'd be good to to move on in a second. But um, are there any examples of like green shoots, even on like a smaller scale, that might already be in existence along the lines that you're talking about this universal public health service might operate? I think you maybe mentioned in the book some local authority managed services um, in different areas. 
Yeah, I, I, th- I think there are two. Um, one that people will have probably not known about going into the pandemic that they will now because they've been brilliant, um, which is the local public health teams that are run within local authorities. And those teams manage a whole range of interventions that aren't, strictly speaking, in many cases, not in all cases, necessarily treatment based. And all evaluation of those schemes suggests that they're brilliant. If we could compress it down into a pill and that went through the government's processes, it would be posted out to everyone with the same urgency as the the vaccine was this Christmas. It genuinely is fantastic in terms of the health benefit that, that it provides and the benefit it provides at a really low cost. So that's things like sexual health services, that's things like safe spaces for drug users, those those kinds of things, they're, they're incredibly effective. I suppose the kind of other case study that's out there uh, that I think is brilliant is the Rose Voucher Scheme. And the Rose Voucher Scheme, I suppose, identifies that when we're thinking about diet and weight and obesity, lots of the kind of solutions that were coming down from government over quite a long period were, were really about putting individual responsibility front and centre and blaming people and, you know, kind of putting an onus on them to eat more healthily and lose weight because uh, if they didn't, it would cause many types of cancer and heart disease. And, and the narrative was quite toxic in that way. And their approach is slightly different. They've identified that in many cases, uh, if not all cases, the, the problem is that people don't have access free at the point of delivery based on needs to affordable, healthy diets. And so what they do is they work with local fruit and veg markets to provide that. And there's no cost. It's given to, to those that most need it. It's available for those that most need it. It's obviously on quite a small scale because it's kind of a community-led scheme rather than a national universal intervention. But again, the results have been overwhelmingly brilliant. So I think there are some examples that we can use as a basis for saying that things that are designed to give people healthy lives before they actually identify a symptom, before they say, oh, I've got a problem here. They work, they're good value, they kind of empirically have an impact on health. And I think there's every reason to put that at the heart of how we approach health at the kind of national level as well. Yeah, I think all those things are really important. I think one that we maybe don't think about, and I'm not sure how much research has been done on this, but another thing to think about is social support. And I have lots of people where I work, and not just elderly, actually, but like it's, it's a massive problem in elderly, but I think isolation as well is a problem amongst people who have chronic health conditions, particularly mental health conditions or disability. And they are really socially isolated and that it can impact your, definitely impacts your mental health, but also your physical health. And I think thinking about these initiatives to try and help people become healthier, whether that's with diet or exercise, thinking about as well how you can bring people together and bring that sense of community is really important. And there have been small examples, like if you look at the Bromley by Bowel practice in East London, I think they do that really well. So they have Within their GP practice, they have like a garden where people can come in and work together in the garden and they have classes where people come together. Um, and I can think of another example. My mom, actually, she so she's in her 60s and she in her area where she lives, they had a cycling scheme and it was teaching people who didn't know how to cycle. So actually it was ended up being majority ethnic minority women, older women, women like my mum, who'd never learned how to cycle. So they taught them how to cycle and then they go on cycles together. My mum absolutely loves it. And it's predominantly women who are in their 50s, 60s, 70s, learning to cycle. They're exercising. They're getting that social support. They're getting out there every weekend, going on these long cycles, going for coffees afterwards. And I just think it's so brilliant for their health and it's bringing them enjoyment as well. So, you know, all these things, it's thinking about how you can encourage healthier, more content, more holistic and more fulfilling lives and I think little things like this can actually make a massive difference to someone's health Mm. yeah absolutely Sonia I mean that that makes me think of one of the chapters I think it's the fourth chapter in the book which is all about social care the care system in in this country is perhaps not really run the way that it should be or thought about the way that it should be and and Chris again in the book you point to some really interesting schemes that are much more about reorientating care back into the community could you say a little bit about some of the ideas in the book around social care from that kind of point of view. Yeah, and social care is an interesting one because I think it's one of the places where there has been some some quite interesting and expansive thinking from the left. And the starting point really is, you know, the kind of ideas that were put forward in the 2019 Labour Manifesto around a national care service are, are quite interesting in terms of having 
you know, free at the point of delivery based on needs at their core, really, in having the aspiration to make uh, social care available to everyone and, and free in a way that the more recent government reforms that many people might have seen, the cap and the floor, um, as it's called, just don't do. And they instead leave a very, very regressive system where the people with the least money will lose almost the entirety of that to care costs if they do find themselves needing social care for any sustained period of time but people with particularly with lots of capital wealth will see themselves able to access much better care in all likelihood and keep hold of of a much bigger amount of that wealth and of course we know that inheritance drives wealth inequality anyway so um, it doesn't change that dynamic so the challenge the kind of 2019 manifesto does have is, you know, if we're making care free and universal, then we need to think really carefully about what kinds of care we are making free and universal. Because at the moment, the standard and quality and personalization of social care is is incredibly poor. So that can be epitomized in two ways. In terms of home care, it can be epitomized by the 15 minute appointment where local authorities, because of cost pressures, still commission flying visits where someone gets you know someone come around and and really really under time pressure provide a very low quality of of very impersonal care probably using a checklist or the other side of this is warehousing where people are in care homes that are the size of a box and there's absolutely nothing that orientates itself around making people's lives good and you know kind of worth living so two two kind of types of care models that are very prevalent today that no means should think that making those universally accessible and free is anything like good enough so the second step the next step the frontier if you like is is really thinking about okay if we agree that there's a growing consensus as as i think there is on the left that social care should be available to all and it shouldn't be something that you know kind of people pay for at their time of need how can we start to think about some of the things that that make that care much better? And I think there are some brilliant examples out there that we can draw on. And those tend to be examples where there's community involvement. So it's co-created with the people that actually draw on care and, and where it's democratically owned. So cooperative models, for example, are are a particularly rich source of um, fantastic care, even in a context where it's very difficult at the moment because of cost pressures to deliver good care. So that's a really, really kind of promising area to look. We can look abroad to some fantastic models of of personalised social care that exist, particularly the Netherlands, very good at this, um, and has developed things like dementia villages where people actually have the, the place that they live kind of designed around what they would have found familiar during life. So based on the kind of places that they lived, the life they led, the dementia home is designed around that level of personalization. You, you just don't see that in the UK at all. So I think the challenge for us is finding ways to to really focus in on that and embed that in our question of universality so that we're saying not just that everyone should have care in some kind of safety net process. But we're actually saying, as Nye Bevan said when he invented the NHS, that the, that the purpose of the National Care Service is to universalise the best. It's to identify what enables flourishing lives, exactly as you say, Sonia, and making sure the delivery mechanism is tied to the kind of outcomes that we want to see. Mm, yeah, thanks, Chris. That definitely rings true. I found the bit about the yeah, the dementia community villages in outside Amsterdam really fascinating. I suppose one issue we have at the moment is that we we simply don't value people that work in the sector, chronically sort of underpaid, and uh, is that that's got to be a first step in trying to attract people to work and stay in the sector. I think there's some statistics in the book which suggest that half of people leave within their first year because it's so dreadful. And yeah, could you speak a little bit more about some of the issues there are with staffing, I guess, in the care sector and also yeah, more, more broadly, it's such a fundamental issue at the moment. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Um, So if we're starting from this, from kind of what in the social care sector would predict a reality where people can can get genuinely brilliant care, then we have to think about two things. I think the labour condition kind of question is vital. And I think the kind of market dynamics and ownership structures are vital as well. And you can't really separate the two because at the moment we have a private equity led social care system that's ever more tending towards massive extractive providers that have no links to their community 
that are making lots of money or you know maximizing the profit they can and often that's at the expense of putting in place the right pay the right conditions the right training and we know that that all in the end has a really big impact on quality and we know that it leads to you know some some kind of more case study based thinking it leads to situations where you've got someone that's that's very vulnerable and needs support and then you've also got a worker that's very vulnerable and maybe not comfortable in the circumstance they're meant to be providing care in and no one comes out of that in a good way so we need to think about it quite carefully um on the worker side itself there's kind of this pay question isn't there that often gets talked about and that probably people will be most familiar with which is to say that Pay in the care sector is very low and a lot of people find themselves on well below what minimum income guarantees and core standards of the money people need to live with would suggest that they need to be paid. But other problems are kind of rife as well. So zero hour contracts are very common. We know that there's been kind of sites of exploitation with people not being paid for travel time, meaning that their pay is slashed because they're going client to client. They're doing maybe these 15 minute appointments. So they're not actually working for very long. They're traveling for quite a long time. Sleep-ins where social care workers haven't been paid at all or, or the minimum wage for work done overnight. And I suppose it all comes down to a system where there isn't really anything like the collective or or sectoral bargaining or the workforce representation that we see in the kind of health sector by contrast. There isn't the same kind of level of just cultural appreciation for the work that social care workers do, although that might change a little bit with the pandemic. And there's there's this kind of toxic ownership model that, that we allow to happen that's very advantageous to the <laughs> to the shareholders and 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 those that back the private equity firms, but very poor for the staff themselves. So um lots of things that we can get our teeth into and think about changing. But Sonia, you'll probably have had more direct experience of seeing this play out in reality. Yeah, I think my feeling is that in this country, we just don't value care. And, you know, care isn't just simply what's what's happening in in care homes or care workers. A lot of people are doing care at home. So whether that's caring for elderly relatives or relatives with disability and care work is hard. You know, I looked after my grandma in her last few months of her life and it was the hardest few months of my life it was extremely extremely difficult and but we just don't value that work of care and I think we also need to be asking that question about what is care a few years ago one of my jobs I used to go into care homes um to see patients in care homes and you know often I would see I would see people being just essentially being left in hospital beds for hours I guess having their pills delivered to them three times a day and being fed and washed and 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 in my head that's not care and care is about showing love and kindness and warmth to enable individuals to have their independence as much as possible and to live their lives as much as possible with fulfillment and contentment and I just don't think we're doing that within care homes at the moment so I think one we need to yes value care properly in this country but also really think about what we mean when we say care and to me care is more than simply making sure that someone's you know had their pills and washed it is about warmth and it's about allowing people to live their lives as much as possible with independence and with dignity I think that's spot on and I think one of the best ways that we can do that as well is to listen more and to find ways to empower the people that draw on care directly um that voice has very little power in the care sector as it's currently organized perhaps driven by you know the fact that we have a heavily marketized social care sector that that is tending as i say to uh, kind of big bmoth care providers so that kind of level of personalization obviously suffers but there are lots of ways to make sure that people who draw on care have the ability to make what makes their life meaningful bear on the kind of care and the kind of support they receive and also you know for that care and support to come earlier because it's about intervening at the point that someone wants and needs care rather than waiting as we currently do for the last possible moment that intervention could possibly happen um, and local authorities with very little money and so thinking about how can we avoid providing care and support at all costs that's a really important way of doing it and fits with most definitions of right-based approaches to social care. Um, That hasn't been very well represented, I don't think, in the National Care Service conversation so far, but is the next step in developing that into something that that is really powerful and would fundamentally change people's lives by making better care universal rather than uh, universalising this really poor standard that we have at the moment. 
Mm, yeah, absolutely. Before we sort of slowly come towards a conclusion in terms of reiterating what you're outlining uh, as a proposal, Chris, is it worth touching on some of the more macroeconomic questions? Because, you know, you, again, you devote a whole chapter to this in the book about how um, large corporations, capitalism, the dynamics of capital more broadly are having a huge impact on health. And there's a, another term that you coin in the book, which is public health net zero. I was wondering if you could speak maybe briefly about this and how this all plays into what we've been discussing. Yeah, I, th I think it's the flip side of the kind of uh, universal public health service that, that I talked about, which is essentially to say that I think we need to recognise if we're thinking about how do we expand our activism and how do we think about that broader definition of health, that we also need to recognise that the economic model that we have is very bad at valuing good health and very good at valuing bad health. So to give an example of that, if I was you know, a big business producing, say, cigarettes, uh, the kind of manufacturing activity that goes into that is counted towards all of our dominant measures, uh, all the output measures, particularly GDP. There's no value for the kind of health consequences that that comes with. So that just isn't really measured at all beyond the kind of narrow focus that might come out of the Department of Health and Social Care that doesn't really get paid attention to. And then if someone develops, say, lung cancer off the back of the tobacco manufacturer, that is again counted as activity towards output measures like GDP. So what we have is a scenario where we have a kind of dominant economic measure that double counts poor health and doesn't count the kind of lost value of, of good health that's, that, that, that goes out the window. And that means we have a situation where the status quo is quite happy and comfortable with profit being made at the expense of health. So whereby the kind of benefits of poor health go to capital and where the, the consequences are felt by individuals that experience poor health, but by the NHS and by you know, the very stretched workers like Sonia that, that are working in the NHS as well. And, and that's a problem because uh, it's just a core injustice. And it's a problem because, frankly, it's extractive. It takes away from the many and supports the, the profit of the few. So something that I think needs action on. Um, public health net zero is intended in the book as a way to think about, is there a target or a set of circumstances that we could envision in which it becomes impossible for those that currently profit from bad health to make a profit at the expense of health. So can we think of the mechanisms by which we just make that far, far, far more difficult to do? And there are case studies in practice that we can draw from and think about as mechanisms to achieve public health net zero. You know, there's a very obvious parallel here, isn't there, to the climate movement. And lots of them have been used by the climate movement effectively in isolated instances as well. But you can think about fiscal measures that are designed to make corporations that do have a net bad impact on health pay. You can think about regulatory measures that just exclude certain activities, or you can think about ownership models. You can think about taking into public ownership markets where they've proven that, you know, the market just can't be trusted with the kind of products that are selling. You know, alcohol is a really good example of, of one candidate for that style of approach. So yeah, public health net zero is really about saying that good health has a value. That value hasn't been recognised by very much of what we do at the moment. And we should be acting far more decisively and collectively to make sure that good health is protected and that individuals don't see their health undermined by bad faith actors. Yeah, as I say, we've not touched on every strand within the book. It would have been possible to do so, but to suffice it to say that the, the vision you outline is very sort of vast, it's very ambitious and all-encompassing. What about the practicalities of trying to implement some of this, you know, the blueprint that you've put forward? How much do you think, for instance, uh, you know, a public health new deal of the, the types that you're describing would cost? I think in the book, you maybe have a figure of like uh, around 100 billion per year, which sounds like a lot. Um, but could you maybe contextualize that for us, for, for the non-economists in the room, how that kind of relates to other government expenditure and where we might see the benefit of putting that money in, in better health outcomes, I suppose? Yeah, absolutely. So you, you're spot on, Chris. 100 billion pound is the, uh, I suppose, the gross expenditure of what a, the kind of public health needs I set out in the book would incorporate. So that covers a kind of significant expansion of um, revitalization of universality in the NHS. That covers 
a universal public health service where if we identify that you know a lack of good housing is going to undermine someone's house then you know they're prescribed a house in the same way that we might um currently prescribe a course of medicine and it covers a major process of valuing care and and reforming social care from the kind of very market-based reforms that they experienced in the 80s to something much more in line with the kind of Bevanite NHS style model and by that I mean one that's focused on quality as well as making sure that it's free and universal. If we're contextualizing can we afford that can we cover you know 100 billion that you know and that will sound very aspirational to lots of people but I think we can think about it in a couple of ways. Firstly we can think about it in terms of the kind of arguments that we've seen for stimulus across the world after COVID-19. So we know that President Biden in America has put lots of headline figures on stimulus. I think two trillion is roughly the total, isn't it? Um, We know that countries like Japan have gone way, way further in terms of stimulus once we account for the relative economic sizes of America and Japan. And we know that health is a really good way to stimulate the economy, if we're thinking about that kind of argument that, that we should invest in growth, then good health is is a good and just way to do that. So there's that that's one kind of argument that you might back the, the public health new deal with. The second side of it is thinking about what was extracted during austerity. So we know that the kind of cost of austerity, the, the amount that was taken out of the public expenditure compared to the trajectory that we had previously been on, was I think the figure I used in the books around 150 to 200 billion pounds. And that's obviously more than the 100 billion that I'm talking about here for the footprint. We also know that the kind of consequence of austerity was uh, there was there was no economic benefit in the way that it was sold and there was huge social detriment from it as well. So it seems adequate that if we're thinking about, well, we've just experienced a big pandemic, we've experienced that off the back of a record acceleration in state funding, that actually finding vehicles like this by which to put money back into our social settlement, into social security, into good health, seems like a good thing to do. I think the last thing to say is that the 100 billion doesn't account for anything that we might recoup on the basis of of health. So uh, as per arguments for green taxes, the public health net zero makes a, a big case for taxing activities whereby, you know, kind of that could be bad employment practices, bad bosses, bad landlords, rentierism, uh, that could be big tobacco, big processed food, big alcohol. But any activity by which our health is exploited for the profit of, of a big corporation. And actually, the kind of income that you can generate off that is pretty big. So that could go a fairly long way to funding things like the Universal Public Health Service. And that's not that's not included in the total cost. So there's three ways of justifying it there. Um, And I'm sure more just on the kind of innate value of health and the social justice argument as well. Yeah, thanks, Chris. That's brilliant. Um, I guess then uh, maybe Sonia, seeing as your your name is on the the book as as an endorser, clearly there's much that Chris is saying that you agree with. I wonder, A, what, what you think is most sort of pertinent or exciting or urgent that we've been talking about today and, or maybe that we haven't talked about today but that's in the book and what you think the the appetite for some of the proposals we've been discussing would be from within the medical profession. So, um, yeah, some, some final thoughts from you, I suppose. Well, I guess the medical profession is quite varied and as, a, as you may or may not know, and many in the medical profession opposed actually the creation of the NHS because they felt it would affect their incomes. Um, <laughs> so I'm sure there would be probably mixed reaction um, from the medical profession. But I guess, you know, I think we can learn from the creation of the NHS. So it was at the time it was this big, old, you know, visionary idea, which many people thought was, you know, blue skies thinking completely impossible. But it was that visionary thinking what led to the NHS. And I think that's what's so exciting and interesting about Chris's ideas. That Again, he's calling for, he's saying that we need to think big um, and we need to be bold and we need to have a transformative vision of how health in this country looks like. Um, So I think it's really exciting. And I think, you know, we have been just like, you know, the period of 1940s. We have, again, in this pandemic, we have had this massive, not just health, but massive economic and social hit to how we're living over the past two years. I think now is the time to think big and to have these big transformative ideas. The whole book is brilliant and I would you know, really encourage everyone, not just people who work in health, but everyone to read it because it is very interesting and it's very got really exciting, well thought out ideas. 
But I think public health net zero is such a you know interesting idea, learning from the climate change movement. And it's you know something that I would wish Labour Party should put in their manifesto right now. Mm. Chris, Sonia, thank you both very much for joining us today. Uh, it's been a really fascinating discussion. And again, I'd reiterate that people can check out the book. It's The Five Health Frontiers, A New Radical Blueprint by Christopher Thomas. And you can get that from plutobooks.com uh, as ever. Podcast listeners can get 50% off the book by using the coupon podcast at the checkout. Uh, and that's on yeah, plutobooks.com, as I say. The book is out this month. It's actually not even out yet as we're recording this, but it will be by the time you're listening. So uh, yeah, do do grab a copy and check it out. And thanks again to you, Chris and Sonia, for joining us. Pleasure. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Chris. That was Chris Thomas and Dr. Sonia Adesara on Radicals and Conversation. The new book, The Five Health Frontiers, is out now. And if you've enjoyed this show, then do consider leaving us a review wherever you listen to your podcasts and share the link online as well. We'll be back with another episode next month. So until then, thanks for listening and goodbye.